right, hey, welcome everybody in the room, everybody tuning in online. Yeah, get excited. Let's go, man. Y'all are rowdy tonight. Ports Live, welcome all the Ports Live locations, in particular Scottsdale, Boise, Midland, North Houston, Tulsa, wherever you are joining us from, we're continuing this series, Ephesians. I'm going to read the passage we're going to be in, and it is a prayer that comes from chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screens, and I'm going to start in verse 14, where Paul lays out one of the best prayers in the New Testament, and he says this, speaking to the Ephesian church, for this reason, talking about the gospel and how it is for all people everywhere, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of the glorious riches, out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's people to grasp how high and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Men. Hey, in the room, anybody grow up playing soccer in here? Yeah, there you go. I didn't grow up playing soccer, but you know, you get it. It's a ball, two goals, you figure it out. And I coach my kids and my son, I coached his soccer team last year and it was a bunch of, at the time, five-year-olds. And you know, how hard could it be? And so day one, show up, practice, teach them how to do it. It's five-year-olds. They're just there for the Capri Sun and orange slices anyways. And try to teach them how to play soccer. We go out for 11 consecutive weeks, the same thing happens over and over and over. And that's called a loss. A lot of teams have in history gone undefeated. This was the first team I'd ever been a part of that just simply went defeated. And every week we would show up and just get destroyed. And so I knew soccer season was coming back, coaching the team again, gonna hopefully have a better record than last year. And so practice has been happening the last few weeks, getting them ready, trying to teach them, you know, these are midfielders and trying to teach them something about the game and to be aggressive. And you're gonna take that ball down the field. Don't score in our goal, score in their goal. And we're practicing. First game came this past Saturday. Show up, game face is ready. It's gonna be awesome. And about 32 minutes later, we had acquired another loss Seven to zero. And I'm just watching these kids and I'm like, man, you guys are, are this, uh, clearly I have failed you as a coach. I mean, this is a picture of us this Saturday out on the field where I'm like, all right, guys, here's the deal. Um, I, I need you to stop losing, okay? Who wants to be a loser here? Anybody? And that's not what I said at all. But I'm trying to go through strategy. I'm like, you can take the ball. I need you to be aggressive. You throw a little elbow. That's okay. And uh, I didn't say that, but man, I was so tempted to. But these are kids that just were not able to succeed and it, candidly, they really didn't know how to. How to not just survive in the game, but really thrive and even be any sort of competitive. And the loss was seven to zero, which is pretty significant among six-year-olds. Now, why do I start there? Because the Apostle Paul is going to, in this prayer, give us a formula, so to speak, for how to succeed in your faith, or how to not just survive, but to thrive in your faith. And apart from knowing that, and in life, we're all gonna have valleys and mountaintops, or highs and lows, good times, hard times. He's gonna give the formula that you and I are to go back to, and he's praying over this Ephesian church that no matter what they face, this should be a part of their journey so that they could not just survive, but thrive and succeed in living out their faith. And so we're going to walk through, but this is going to give an answer to a lot of some of the questions that all of us have just in life of how do I go through life and like be okay when things are not okay. He's going to give some of the ingredients that make up 
people in the room right now that, man, you're going through trying times, but you just have like a peace about you. And it's because of your awareness and your practice of the things that Paul is saying. And he's recording some words that I hope bury into your heart for the rest of your life. Because as things go well and things don't, it is knowing and understanding these that will allow you to be okay in that journey and not just to survive, but to thrive in your faith. As we said, the book of Ephesians, if you were joining us for the first week, uh, about three weeks ago, we were in the book or chapter two of Ephesians. And if you missed it, all of that's available on the podcast or on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to stuff. And basically the book of Ephesians was a letter written to the church in Ephesus. Where is Ephesus? Today, it's a modern day Turkey. It was a coastal city, very influential city, very wealthy city, had a climate that made it something akin to LA. It was incredibly just a fluent, nice place to live right on the coast. You can go visit it and get on a plane today and there's still a large city that exists there. And the apostle Paul, he loved the church in Ephesus. He spent more time there than almost any other place that he would spend time. And he's writing to this young church and he's saying, man, hey, I am hitting my knees praying for you. And here's what I'm praying. And Paul writes this from a prison cell. We know that it's about 60 AD, 30 years after Jesus. And Paul's sitting in a prison cell and he's writing different letters to the churches. And he writes and says, man, this is what I am praying for you. And I'm gonna walk back slower or more slowly through verses 14 through 21. And he's coming out of the first part of chapter three, where he basically, in light of the gospel we covered in chapter two, that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. And anyone who accepts him as the payment for their sin, their Lord and their savior can have eternal life. And he, in the first part that we're not gonna read tonight, he basically saying, hey, it's not just Jews. It's not just Gentiles, it's everybody. And he's trying to correct, or he just corrected the flawed mentality a lot of people in that day had that God is up in heaven going, man, I just love the Jewish people and everybody else, you know, I'm pretty cool with, but man, at the end of the day, give me a J, give me an E, give me a W, go Jews, that's the team that I'm on. And Paul's saying, no, that's not, no, no, that's all off. That the message in the gospel is for all people everywhere. That Jesus paved a way and created a bridge for all people. And then he turns and he begins to pray. And so let me read the first two verses again, and I want to highlight something that he says. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. He's just painting a picture of how great and grand and big God is. Every person who's ever existed, every family that's ever existed, comes from the source of life, which is God. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit, that his Holy Spirit would give you power in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That the apostle Paul is gonna pray some interesting things. I mean, if you're Paul and you know all the challenges they're facing in Ephesus, Ephesus is not an easy city to be a Christian. These are young believers. It's a very different day and age. You know, all the niceties of our modern world didn't exist. And they're growing a church in a very hostile environment of all the things you could have prayed. I'm praying God will strengthen you with his spirit on the inside and that Christ will dwell in your heart through faith. What does that mean? Well, the first thing that Paul is pointing at is I'm praying that Christ would lead you, that you would let or the first idea that you would be led by Christ. Now, you probably have heard that before. Here's why I say that, and here's why that matters. He just used the expression, Christ would dwell in your hearts by faith. Now, if you're like me and you grew up in church, you may have heard the expression before, hey, boys and girls, who would like to accept Jesus into their heart? Anyone ever heard this before? Typically, it was painted like, would you like to go spend eternity in heaven with all the chocolate in the world and your parents and your family, or would you like to go to hell forever? Huh? It was a very simple decision as a kid. You're like, uh, I'm gonna go with the chocolate even though I don't fully connect the dots on what this means. Is that what he's talking about? No. That phraseology is not even great phrasing. Uh, I get the sentiment, but that's not a biblical idea in terms of being saved, of asking Jesus into your heart as though you know, Jesus would appear from out of nowhere and just be shrunk down, honey, I shrunk the kid style and go right into your heart. That's not a biblical idea. But this phrase that he's talking about is not about salvation. He's saying, 
I'm asking that Christ would come make his home and his spirit would set up shop in your heart through faith. What is he saying? He's praying, hey, that you would be led by Christ. Here's why I mean that. When you think about the heart, and the Bible says, you know, loving the Lord your God with all of your heart. It says that you need to protect your heart because everything you do, the Proverbs say, flows from your heart. What is it saying? Well, you probably haven't thought about this, but it's not saying your physical heart. In other words, when you hear that, you understand it's a metaphor. The heart means something in the Bible. It is a word that is an attempt to describe the control center of your life. That would be your emotions, your feelings, your decision-making, your will, your personality, all of that would be your heart. In other words, we understand when somebody says, man, I'll give you my heart, they're not saying they wanna like be, sign up to be a transplant donor to you. They're saying in dating context, man, I, I love you. Because we understand it, it represents the control center of their life, their feelings. And Paul is saying, hey, here's what I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you would be led by Christ and you would allow him to make his dwelling or to make a home inside of the control center of your life. You would allow him to come in and inform how you date, how you think, how you spend, how you work. There would be no competition for, hey God, you come in, you are leading my life. I'm gonna trust you, you come make your home. And the language he uses is to dwell or to make a home. When I got married to my wife, we moved in together, which I would highly recommend when you get married, and <laughs> things very quickly began to change for me. Here's what I mean. I just mean like my environment, like where I existed, dramatically changed overnight. I was a single guy, I just didn't have a lot of stuff. I slept on a futon every night. All I owned was some books, clothes, and like, I, I don't even know that I owned anything else other than the futon, than that. Then we got married, and all of a sudden, Slowly over time, as you had this relationship came in, she began to redecorate everything. And so the futon, it's gone. Clothing stuff begins to appear on the walls. Guys don't decorate and put things on the walls, or at least I didn't. And, you know, pillows. They begin to bring in truckloads of pillows (laughs) and rugs. Rugs. We put rugs. I don't know why you need rugs, but they would just show up and they were everywhere. And she began to, one by one, over time, just begin to redecorate the home. Is that she made it home, she was going to bring some redecorating. And Paul is saying, hey, I'm praying that you will trust Jesus. That's what word by faith means. And you would allow Jesus to come into your life and to redecorate your home. That he's going to show up and he's going to begin to say, hey, I'm going to begin to change some things in here. And the old way you used to date and the old way you used to live and the old way you used to spend and the old way you used to talk and the old way you used to think about forgiving people or relationships and hurts, I'm gonna begin to change and redecorate. And Paul is saying, when that begins to happen, I'm praying that you will trust him and follow him, that you would be willing to be led by Jesus as it relates to all of your life. I mean, candidly, this is why some of you guys, you've seen this begin to happen firsthand. Like you trusted in Jesus and all of a sudden things began to change. And it wasn't because somebody stood up here and gave you a 10 list, you know, do this, X, do this, X, do this. You just began to follow Jesus. You began to live in community with other believers and he just began to change how you think about dating relationships, how you think about the opposite sex, how you think about your job, how you think about life. He began to like lead you to forgive that parents who really hurt you. And it was because he began to come in and make his home in your heart and begin to change. That you begin to go, man, I've never dated a guy actually like and kept physical boundaries, but I began to actually follow Jesus. And now I'm going, hey, I wanna prioritize pursuing purity because Jesus has made his home in your control center of your life and you've trusted him. And Paul's saying, man, I'm praying that you will continue to be led and trust him and that you would be strengthened from within to follow his lead, that you would let him drive. And then he gives a second prayer, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's people to grasp how high, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Paul is writing all of this. He's hitting his knees 
on the floor of a prison cell saying, man, I'm praying that you will allow Christ to lead your life. And I'm praying that supernaturally God will allow you to know how deeply loved you are. And that love would anchor you or root you or give you security. When's the last time you heard anybody pray anything like that? I mean, if we're honest, just most of our prayers, it's like, God, we help me to get the raise. We help me to get to work on time. We help me to hit the green light. We help me to, you know, heal somebody that I know. And out of everything Paul could pray for, he's saying, and I am begging God to help you be rooted in his love, that you would have a foundation that is strong and secure because you understand how deeply loved you are by God. The second idea from the text is that Paul prays that we would be secure in Christ's love, that you would have security that comes from an awareness of God's love for you. The picture of being rooted is a picture for plants, that a tree, the deeper its roots go into the soil, the more stable and secure it is. And Paul says, if you wanna have more stability, more security, you wanna experience growth in your life, It comes from you having roots that go deep into understanding God's love for you. It doesn't come from understanding more Bible verses, which is a good thing. Doesn't come from attending more church services, which is a good thing. Doesn't come from memorizing a certain number of passages. He says, I'm praying, all those things are great, but you would be rooted in an awareness of how deeply loved you are. Here's why I think this is such an important thing and we can quickly dismiss and be like, yeah, he loves me, he loves the whole world, but why it really matters. Your perspective on God's love for you right now, where you are, sitting here, listening online, joining in another location, is gonna determine when you inevitably fail God and you do the thing you promised you would never do again, you guys cross the physical boundary again, you look at pornography again, you end up drinking too much at the happy hour and you promised and you were done, and whenever that happens, and whatever that looks like, your perspective on whether God and his perspective on you and his love for you has changed or not is going to determine whether in those moments you're gonna run from God or you run towards him. That without a death grip on men, I am loved. I have a strong foundation. And it doesn't come from my behavior. It comes from an awareness that I am loved. Is what allows you to run towards God when those moments of failure happen. There's actually a real life example of this in the Bible. The Apostle John was unique in a lot of respects. And Apostle John was one of the 12 disciples. So Jesus on the planet has these 12 guys, one of them named John, one of Jesus' best friends. And Jesus, on the night before he's crucified, is betrayed by Peter, and then he's abandoned by all 12 disciples. Jesus even predicted, hey guys, I'm gonna get arrested soon. All of you guys are gonna scatter. You're not even gonna act like you know me, and you're all gonna abandon me in my worst moment. And all the disciples are listening and they're like, no, not me, not me, I'll be willing to die for you. And just as Jesus said, a few hours later, he's arrested, he's led away to be crucified and all of them scatter, all of them run, all of them abandon him. And the next day, he's led out to be crucified and we're told of only one disciple who shows up at the cross, John. All the other ones had abandoned him and there's no mention or reference to them. But John, despite having abandoned him 12 hours earlier, feels as though he can still approach Jesus, the guy that he had promised, I'll never abandon you. Why did he have that ability? Why would he be the only one that is referenced as showing up at the cross? Well, he's not just unique in that he's the only one mentioned. He's unique in that he had a unique nickname that he had given himself. And I think this nickname reflected a perspective that he had that allowed him, despite having failed, I know that I can approach Jesus. And his nickname was this, five times in his own gospel, he refers to himself every time the same way. The disciple whom Jesus loved. 
which is a funny way of putting it. I mean, if you're the other disciples, every time John refers to himself, he's like, Peter was there, Andrew, and the disciple whom Jesus loved. I mean, if you're the other guys you're reading, you're like, take it easy, John, he loved all of us. But John's like, so caught up in his identity coming from God's and Jesus's love for him. I mean, I want you to think about that. In other words, his identity wasn't informed by how much he loved Jesus. It was informed by how much Jesus loved him. And it is that that allowed him, even after failing like all the other guys, he distinctly comes to the cross and approaches despite having failed Jesus. Because he saw himself as my identity doesn't come from what I've done, what I do, or even how much I love Jesus. It comes from how much Jesus loves me. And it is having that grip that Paul is saying, man, I'm praying above everything I could pray. I pray that you would have an awareness of how deeply loved you are. I know that in my own perspective, I probably have a flawed at best understanding because Paul says, man, this is going to give you stability and continue to grow you and anchor you in your faith that you know how loved you are. So many of the problems in our world and candidly in a lot of our lives can be traced to seeking and desiring to feel or want to feel loved. And Paul is saying, I'm praying you wouldn't seek that other places. You would know how loved you are. What do I say problems? I was reading this past week a book by Patrick Carnes, who's one of the leading psychologists of today, particularly in the realm of addiction. And he's not a believer, but he writes, and he's an award-winning psychologist on behavioral patterns and addiction. And he wrote something in one of his books called Out of the Shadows about his conclusion about what fuels a lot of addiction. And it was a pretty fascinating thing. He said, at the heart of addict behavior, it's fueled by believing they are unlovable and or unloved. So many of the issues that you know, people wrestle with can be traced to this emptiness, or this feeling like, oh, man, I don't know that I am worth loving. And Paul's saying, I pray that you would have a flood of understanding of how loved that you are. Kesha did an interview with the Rolling Stone. Feels like a curveball, but (laughs) in it, she said something that was interesting for a girl who has everything. She has beauty, she has fame, she has money, she has success, she's brilliant. And in it, she said, I'm a crusader for being yourself and loving yourself. But I found it very hard to practice. I'll be unavailable for the next season seeking treatment for an eating disorder. That she's going, I am finding it difficult to find myself worth loving. And the challenge of her saying, man, I can't love myself, is ultimately if your focus is self-love, the focus of your love is self. And Paul says, man, I'm praying that you'll have a death grip on the fact that you, no matter what you do for the rest of your life, no matter how many times you fail, you are loved by God and that will anchor you because it's gonna shape you and it's gonna shape me. And he's saying, man, I'm praying that you would be secure in Christ's love. So many of the dating relationships in the room, candidly, are driven by the fact that you don't think that you're worthy or valuable, or you think of yourself as damaged goods, so you lower your standards. Or you think that no one will ever want to date somebody like you. So you turn to pornography. One of the top reasons people turn to pornography is a desire to feel desired. And Paul, it makes sense when you begin to see all the different ways it plays out inside of our life. I mean, how much just the fear of how we look makes us, or wanting to be loved, makes us dress certain ways and something tighter and something that goes lower or comes up higher. It's no wonder plastic surgery is at an all-time high. People chasing the desire to feel accepted, to feel loved, to feel affirmed. And Paul says, man, there's a love that I'm begging God to give you supernatural ability to see. And he says it's four-dimensional. It's wide enough for all of mankind. It is a love that is greater than anything you would understand. It is deeper and deep enough to reach into the darkest sinner's heart. It is long enough to scale and will scale eternity. It is high enough to bring all things into the heavenly places. And I'm praying for you to know it. And he says something so interesting. He says, I'm praying you will know the love of God 
that surpasses knowledge. I'm praying this love that is so grand, so high, so large, so wide, so incredible, four dimensions, I'm praying and asking God for you to know it because it surpasses knowledge. For you to experience it. He gives four dimensions. If you've heard of 4D movies before, there's something uh, for those of us, or if you haven't, I went to a 4D movie about a year ago uh, with one of my kids at this movie theater. And in the movie theater, what makes a 4D, if you haven't been one, is it takes 3D, we have the glasses, and then it adds physical elements so you have another dimension and you experience it. In other words, when I was at, put on the glasses, watching like some Lego movie, and all of a sudden, you're seeing everything in 3D, but then snow, fake snow begins to fall, and fake wind begins to blow, and fake rain begins to fall. The difference between the 3D and the 4D is you feel it. You experience it. And Paul is saying, man, I'm praying that God would allow you a 4D understanding of his love, that you would experience it, that it would begin to rush into your life. Because here's what, here's what I just know, at least for me, and I think for a lot of Christians, when we think of the love of, love of God, we're like, man, that's so sweet and that's great. Now, yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. And, um, you know, he's a loving God and it's great. And Paul is saying, this is the thing that changes everything. It's immeasurable, other than when you look at the cross. It's the only measuring unit that we have. Depicts God's love of giving his own son on the cross for you and me. That there's no length I could go that would be greater. And he's saying, man, I'm praying that it would have a death grip in your life. Like, here's what I mean when we kind of underplay. It's almost like we think of God's love, and it's, it's like we think of um, the difference between sprinkling outside and a hurricane. When the Bible describes his love, it's like it is like nothing. It's like a hurricane flood of rushing waters. And I think a lot of times we think of it as like, it, it, it's kind of raining, like we go outside, and it's, oh, it's kind of sprinkling. There's a little sprinkle over here, and there's some little rain over here. And Paul is saying, it's like a hurricane of... And I'm praying that it would fall on you and you would understand it. And that would impact the rest of your life. And then, after moving into being secure in his love, he says, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. He he uses plan words in the Greek, which was the original language. He's saying, I'm praying that you would be full and experience some of the fullness of God. His prayer includes, hey, I'm praying you'd be led by Christ, you would be secure in the love of Christ, and that you would find satisfaction, or point three, be satisfied in Christ. The same word in Greek for satisfied is filled. He says, I'm praying you'd be filled. I'm praying you'd be satisfied. I'm praying that you would not look to other things that cannot fulfill what only Christ can. That you wouldn't look to a job. You wouldn't look to a paycheck. You wouldn't look to some future day where you're married and everything's pretty and you've got all the different dreams and hopes that you have and believe the lie that, hey, once I'm there, then I'll be satisfied. That you would know there is only one source. And the reason this is important is if you operate and seek to be satisfied or seek and look to other things around you in the world, they're going to leave you empty. And he's saying, man, I'm praying that you would be filled and know where you can experience being filled at a soul lever, level. Whenever I go shopping, which is not often, but I've done it before, and especially grocery shopping, I can't go grocery shopping if I'm hungry. Because what happens? We've all been there before. You end up being like, oh, look, Tostitos has another new, I've never like, even seen this flavor before. It's on sale and let's get it. And you end up buying all these different things that you don't need and you're eating in the car on the way home just because you haven't eaten. And I think Paul is saying, man, I'm hoping you don't go through life making decisions, living from a place where because of an emptiness inside of you, You seek to fill it with things that can never provide lasting satisfaction. That you would be satisfied and you would experience that at the only place where it is available, which is in Christ. 
What's interesting in today's age is we look at uh, Hollywood and you look at all the successful music artists, you look at people that have everything that everybody wants. And in particular in the music industry, it's a really fascinating one because we have a firsthand look into some of the music they write and some of the lyrics that they put out. And these are men and women who have everything. I mean, they have the house, they have the cars, they have the lifestyle the world wants. And yet they write lyrics every now and then that just sleep out or just pop out there and they're not, you know, the off the wall to the window, but they actually have meaning. <laughs> and you go, wow, you're really lonely. What are some examples of what I mean by that? Of people that despite having everything the world says would satisfy go, I feel empty. Olivia Rodrigo has a song called Jealousy, Jealousy. Just listen to these lyrics. I and mean, this is someone who, by the world's standards, is famous, beautiful, popular. And she writes, I want to be you so bad, and I don't even know you. All I see is what I should be, happier, prettier. I'm so sick of myself, I'd rather be anyone, anyone else. Juice World, who sadly passed away because of his battle with depression and battle with being unable to feel something that only Christ can. In one of his songs, Wishing Well, ring, ring, phone call from depression. On the other line, I talk to addiction. Speaking of the devil, all the drugs, I miss them. Something feels broke on the inside. Need to fix it. I mean, even Stressed Out, which is like one of the more popular songs of the last couple years by 21 Pilots, Listen, I mean, they all got tunes until, until you like stop and you're like, wow, man, you are really lonely. <laughs> like you need Jesus. You're just kind of nodding your head along listening to it on the radio, but listen to part of the lyrics in there. I was told when I get older, all my fears would shrink. But now I am. I'm insecure. I care what people think. Wish we could turn back time to the good old days. When mama sang us to sleep, but now we're stressed out. Even Bieber describing all the wild success he had of what if you had it all but no one to call? Maybe then you'd know me because I've had everything, but no one's listening. And that's just so lonely. I'm so lonely. Lonely. Now, these have great beats, and a lot of us are very familiar with them. But when you stop and you go, their description of a life that has everything the world says matters, they're describing. The world has sold a lie and none of this stuff satisfies because it doesn't. And there's only one place that you and I can find satisfaction, that there's no relationship, there's no salary. Whatever you make right now, if you doubled it, it wouldn't be enough. Whatever your relational status is, if you had fill in the blank of what you wanted, it would still not be enough apart from Christ. And Paul saying, hey, I'm praying you would know how loved you are. You would have a security. You're not gonna look at the world and try to fix it by everybody else or try to fix it by the next thing or the next relationship or the next job or the next purchase. I'm gonna Find it in the only place I can, which for the rest of your life is in a relationship with Jesus. And Paul says, man, I'm praying that you would be filled by the fullness of God. The fullness of God is more than enough to fill every single human soul and human heart that's ever existed. And he's saying you would experience the fullness that is far more than enough. It's like this. This is an empty water bottle. He's saying, I'm praying that you would know that there is far more than enough and you would go deep into knowing the character and the love of God and that would experience, and you would experience that it is more than enough, that you would be surrounded by his love, you would be filled by his love and you would experience a fullness that comes only from knowing Christ. You can golf clap or not, I don't care. <laughs> and I'm gonna transition here, but listen to me very clearly. I know I can talk up here like this for, for 30 minutes. I can show you an illustration. I can do all of that. And sadly, a lot of you don't believe me. And you can hear it, and you're taking notes, and you may be even saying golf clap, and that's good. But you live a life that reflects the fact that you actually think if he would just call you back, you'd be okay. You actually think if you would have just gotten into that certain school, then, oh man, life would have been so much better, and what if? And you have bought a lie 
Because that's the way it can play at us. Like we can buy into this mentality that, oh man, if only I had, then I would have been so much more satisfied. Or if only someday. And Paul is saying, hey, I'm praying you would live from a fullness that comes. And there's only one place where it comes. And I'm praying God will give you the supernatural strength. This is why he starts on the inside. That's why he starts saying, I'm praying God will give you power. The power that raised Christ from the dead now indwells you. You have the spirit of God. And I'm praying he will allow you to know his love that would secure you and you would experience soul satisfaction. And for the rest of your life, for the rest of my life, if you want to experience satisfaction, it's not going to come through any of the different things that I've listed out. There is only one place. And if you just forget everything I'm saying, and in six years from now, you walk out of the church today and you don't come back for another decade and you come back, the message will be the same. There is only one place and one person that can give you satisfaction. And it's Jesus. And so, of course, Paul is going, man, I, I get on my knees, Ephesian church. Yeah, I know everything you're facing, all the persecution you're facing. I'm sitting in a prison cell, and I am praying uh, prayers you've never heard anybody pray like this. I'm praying God will let you be anchored in his love. Really, Paul? Can you just pray for, for me to get a raise? I've been making $20 an hour for the last four years. And Paul's going, the thing you need more than any of the things that you think that you need is a deeper understanding of God's tsunami of love for you displayed perfectly on the cross to be led by his spirit and Jesus to come in and when he begins to redecorate, you trust him and you say, God, I'm, I'm doing it your way. We're not keeping my furniture. You move in, you take over, you take the wheel. And for you to look to the only one that can satisfy, which is him. Amen. It's a pretty powerful prayer. And I want to transition and I want to bring up a brother in Christ who has embodied for years and is embodying even right now what it looks like to say, Jesus, I want you above anything else. I want more of you. And I want to treasure more of you. And so any way that I can do that, I want to do. And so will you help welcome JD up here? All right, what's up, everyone? Uh, if we haven't met, my name is JD, and uh, I have worked here at the porch for the last, going on a little over three years. And if you've been around here, you might have noticed that through Awaken and different things, I have been absent for the last about six or seven weeks. If you haven't noticed, this is your first time here, and you're going, I have no idea who this guy is. Welcome to kind of like an awkward family meeting. Uh, but if you know, you know. Uh, man. I needed that word tonight. I need that reminder. Um, I want to let you guys in on just some stuff going on in my life. Um, when I moved here three years ago, I moved from College Station, Texas, and had no idea what God had in store. Uh, I came here to do the Watermark Institute to be a student of his word. I was on the production team uh, here at the porch. And next thing I know, in a matter of months, I became a teacher of God's word for the first time. And throughout the three years of teaching here, which has been such a joy, I don't know when it began, I don't know how exactly it began, but I have found myself, just like you guys, I've said that from day one, I'm no different than you, but I have found myself at 29, 28, 27, sitting way too much in the seat of being a minister and not being ministered to. I found myself in the seat of being asked questions by people and being looked to to have answers and not sitting in the seat of asking more questions. I found myself somewhere along the way getting caught up in believing the lie that because I'm doing right things, that means that I am operating in right living. And somewhere along the way, as you'll hear, um, I've woken up to the reality that my life has gone from doing right things and I've missed the real thing in a relationship with Jesus. And where that came to be is I found myself, as it kind of seemed like I was operating in this mentality of needing to have the answers, being looked to as a leader, and thinking that, man, I just, I need to carry these burdens in this weight um, just somewhere deep in my subconscious. 
I found myself running at times to safe people, my people, safe places, and what that actually ended up looking like at the beginning of August is my birthday, and uh, me and some friends, some dear friends, some close friends, and some family went on a beach trip to celebrate, and during that week, not only is it my birthday, but it's also um, my dad, my best friend's death anniversary. And um, it had been seven years, and that night I found myself upset. Um, I found myself anxious. I found myself frustrated with God. And honestly, I found myself just wanting to be human, to be mad. And so in that mindset of wanting to run to a safe place, wanting to be off for a night, I chose to make compromising decisions around alcohol. And just frankly, I drank too much. And being in a public place, drinking too much as a pastor, it's not becoming of a leader that you deserve. And I put my wife, I put my friends in a position that they should never have to be in as a leader. I was not operating as a leader. And I take full responsibility for my actions. And I just wanna say it was sin. I sinned before God, my people, and I sinned against you and I'm sorry. Uh, after getting back from the trip, I immediately confessed to people around me and then I confessed to the leaders here at Watermark, um, all that took place, and they have responded with care, um, with correction, and with grace, and they have walked with me so well in this really just revealing season. I, uh, before what I'm about to say, what I don't want this to seem like is the young guy made a mistake one night and now he's having to get up here and do this because what I've had to come personally to realize is that you don't just get to a place of making a, a mistake like this as a pastor and as a leader overnight. That this outward expression of all the inward reality and feeling, it was a drift. It was something in my heart that took place over time. And so I have spent the last six weeks, I'm gonna to continue to spend as long as it takes, just like it was a drift to run away from God in the midst of all of the things I was feeling, it's gonna be a drift to run back to God. It's gonna take time, it's gonna take a season to get back to the place that I wanna be, the place of health that I wanna be with God because what you guys deserve is a person up here that you can trust. That if I'm gonna call you to believe that God is enough, that in him is the fullness of satisfaction, that when you're anxious, when you're sad, when you're lonely, if I'm gonna call you to run to him and not to the things of the world, I have to practice that myself. And I am frustrated, sometimes I'm embarrassed. The enemy has tried to condemn me but I do believe that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I want you to know that God in this six weeks has already redeemed so much and he has revealed so much. And I am so thankful. This is only God. Only God can take these moments and bring beauty from ashes and he's doing it. And I am falling deeply in love with Jesus again. And when I started doing this, thank you. <laughs> when I started doing this, I always said, man, I just wanna make sure that things stay in the right order. I don't want anything to be outwardly if it's not re real inwardly. And I was blind for a season and this woke me up. And I don't wanna be blind. The reality is, is a lot of people in these positions, guys, pray for leaders in these positions. It is hard. But the reality is a lot of people end up in a really, really, really bad place because in these moments, in these warning signs, they didn't run to God. They kept running, they kept hiding, they kept managing. 
and it's just not worth it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing. I uh, made the decision to transition off staff for a season um, because I believe that our God is a restoring God, I believe that I will be back fully restored to ministry one day. I do believe that. However, I am gonna take a season away because I wanna really make sure, I wanna make sure that God has healed every part of my heart. I wanna grieve my dad, honestly. I wanna really grieve it. I wanna focus on my marriage, on my community, I wanna be invested in church, and I just wanna be restored. And so, I wanna ask you guys for forgiveness. I love you guys. I'm gonna be sad, I'm gonna miss this place a lot. You guys are like a family to me. Um, but please be praying. Please be praying as we enter this next season, um, as I continue to heal and continue to walk with Jesus and people just be praying for me and for my family, for the people around me. Um, it was fitting. Every, every year I asked God, every birthday, so that trip, I asked God, what is the word for the year? And he said, more. And I didn't know what that meant at the time. And it's just so funny that tonight I'm here and the passage, the end of the passage, the end of the prayer, what does he say? He says, now to him, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generation forever and ever, amen. And I'm hopeful. I believe that God is about to do immeasurably more to this ministry in my life and I hope in your life. And I just wanna say as I wrap up and these guys come up here to pray over me, do not wait like I did. God was granting me little signs along the way. Hey, are you sure you're fully healed from that? Are you sure you're fully well from that? Are you sure you're being honest about the burdens you're carrying? And I chose to keep going and keep going until it all came up. And so I would just ask you tonight, whatever it is, let this be your warning sign. We're no different. We're called. We are all called if you are in Christ. Let this be your warning sign. Talk to somebody. Bring it to the light. Be free. And my prayer is that tonight would be a night that God does immeasurably more. Thank you. We love JD, he's got people around him. He, at, he decided to share here, which is a reflection of his character. This wasn't a come up, this was a hey, I love these people. And we believe, and I've said since I met JD, I love him and believe in him and wanna pray and ask that he would do more. And um, Father, I thank you for JD. I thank you for the life, the man that he is. I thank you for the courage he has consistently had. I think for the openness. And I, we ask that you would do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask, think, or imagine. We thank you that you are not done with any of us and none of us deserve anything. And yet you allow us to be part of that. And I thank you for him. I thank you for just the ways he is following you and setting an example for all those in this room. And so I pray that he would leave tonight and I pray that you would allow your spirit to strengthen his inner being and you would allow him to know how deeply loved he is. And that has never changed, that will never change. And you would do through his life, through this season and through the future through his surrender and faithfulness to you more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. Would you do more for your glory in this generation and every generation? In Christ's name, amen.
We love JD, and I'm so proud of him. And like I said, that he made that decision. And he made that decision because he knows who loves him, his security, where it comes from, and wants Jesus above anything else. And all of us in life have seasons where we need to say, man, I need to step back. And I want Jesus more than anything else. And I think some one or someone's, maybe God has you here. So you could see that step of faithfulness. Of just saying, God, I, I don't want anything that's going to get in the way of you. And I can respond to your love. And I can bring out and confess or walk in the light and do that because I'm securing that love. And so I, I want to pray for us and I want to pray for all of us in the room to be more and more of God's men and God's women. And I'm going to do so by doing what Paul did here in just a second. I'm going to hit knees and just pray that God would allow all of us to have an experience of the things that Paul asked for. But if you're in that season, man, God is whispering to you, I love you and I want you to experience more of my love by stepping towards freedom. Let me pray. Father, I pray for every believer who has the Spirit of God indwelling them in this place, in every location, maybe at a future day that's listening, and I bow my knees before the Father, and I pray that you would allow Christ to lead our lives. And we just say, God, if there is an area where there's redecorating, would you help us by the power of your spirit? I pray that you would allow us to have an awareness of how deeply loved that we are, and we would come back to that and come back to that, and that would anchor us, that we would live lives that do what your younger brother Jude wrote in his letter. Keep yourselves in the love of God as you wait. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And Father, would we seek to be filled and satisfied in you? Forgive us for all the ways that we don't. And would you help us by your spirit? We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.